writing to the Romans, the Apostle Paul stumbled on the deliverance available to us in Jesus Christ. And so he said, who will rescue me? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Our second reading is from the book of Daniel, a story about deliverance, Daniel 6. Listen once more for the word of the Lord. Then the king gave the command, and Daniel was brought and thrown into the den of lions. The king said to Daniel, May your God, whom you faithfully serve, deliver you. A stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet and with the signet of his lords, so that nothing might be changed concerning Daniel. Then the king went to his palace and spent the night fasting. No food was brought to him, and sleep fled from him. And then, at break of day, the king got up and hurried to the den of lions. When he came near the den where Daniel was, he cried out anxiously to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you faithfully serve, been able to deliver you from the lions? Daniel then said to the king, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lions' mouths so they would not hurt me, because I was found blameless before him. And also before you, O king, I have done no wrong. Then the king was exceedingly glad and commanded that Daniel be taken up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den and no kind of harm was found on him because he had trusted his God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I am so excited for this sermon series, uh, spending time with the spirituals, and for some of the songs that we will get to go through and that we will get to sing, like hearing you sing This Little Light of Mine just a few minutes ago. And my prayer is that if we, as we sing that week after week, that that song will begin to move from your head down into your body a little bit, and maybe you'll, you'll feel free to move a little bit. And, and to feel that song and really sing this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. I apologize for my voice. I'm kind of on the far side of a cold. And so if it's hard to listen to, forgive me and please pray with me that I can get through this okay this morning and that God will speak to us in my raspy voice. Would you join me in prayer? God, thank you for this opportunity we have to listen carefully for your voice. Speak to us now by your spirit, wherever we are, to each of us, young or old and far in between. Speak a word that is on target for us, needed for us, that will strengthen our faith and hope through Christ our Lord. Amen. Didn't my Lord deliver Daniel, deliver Daniel, deliver Daniel? Didn't my Lord deliver Daniel, and why not everyone? The key imagery of this song is drawn from Daniel's experience in the lion's pit. Trapped with no way out, utterly dependent on God's justice and help, and miraculously delivered from certain death. And the song poses a question, repetitively driving it home to our souls, calling for an answer. Didn't my Lord deliver Daniel, deliver Daniel, deliver Daniel? Didn't my Lord deliver Daniel, and why not everyone? The song catches up other imageries of deliverance from Scripture. Jonah in the belly of the fish before he was vomited out onto dry land. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who were asked to walk in the fiery furnace in a place of certain death until they saw a fourth one walking with them and they were delivered untouched and unharmed. A call to prayer for deliverance and help for all people. The image of a large ship that will safely take the faithful across the dangerous river and across the boundary to the promised shore of Canaan. 
Didn't my Lord deliver Daniel, deliver Daniel, deliver Daniel? Didn't my Lord deliver Daniel? And why not everyone? The final question brings it home to us, asking us to hope, to believe, to resist despair. Why not everyone? Why not you or me? Why not the promise of deliverance for everyone who is bound and desperate to be free? You see, enslaved African Americans picked up this thread of a story of Daniel to speak to their experience. But they were not the first ones to see power and strength and hope and faith in this story. There's a synagogue in Palestine from the 6th century where a mosaic of Daniel was placed on the floor in front of the shrine to the Torah. In the 6th century, Byzantine Christians were persecuting Jews. And there in the synagogue, the rabbi would stand on the mosaic of Daniel, naked, surrounded by lions, Daniel was, and the rabbi would lift the prayers of the synagogue and would join their experience of suffering and being threatened and desperate for survival to Daniel's prayer in the lion's pit for deliverance. The early Christians saw in Daniel, the lion's den, an image of personal resurrection. In the catacombs of Rome, which is the caves sort of underneath the city where folks are buried, there, was, there are depictions throughout of Daniel, once again naked, that means vulnerable, surrounded by lions praying. And so it was an image of resurrection and hope when a family would come to visit the body of their loved one, the image would capture all of the promises of God to inexplicably rescue us from danger to make a way out of no way. So the image of Daniel praying in the lion's den is hope of resurrection for the person who is deceased. And it is hope of a new chapter, a new way through a dark place for the family that is grieving and trying to find a new path. Many centuries later, the image of Daniel praying and in the lion's den was used by the French Huguenots who were persecuted for their faith in Catholic France. The French Huguenots were Reformed Christians, like we are, and they were persecuted violently by King Louis XIV in the 17th century for practicing their faith. So Charles Brusson wrote a book to all of his French citizens to explain their courage in worshiping and praying publicly, even though it meant violent repression. The image that Charles Brusson used, the image of Daniel praying publicly and then being delivered from the lion's pit by a faithful God. For centuries, this has been an image of resistance in the face of evil. In 1909, Mahatma Gandhi was released from a South African prison. He said that he took great comfort reading the book of the prophet Daniel because, quote, Daniel was one of the greatest passive resistors that ever lived and that the Indian people must follow his example. Mahatma Gandhi saw in Daniel an image of nonviolent resistance. When Gandhi was leading the people of India against British colonial rule, a German newspaper wrote a, drew a cartoon that had a bunch of people spinning uh, at weaving wheels, which is what Gandhi asked them to do, surrounded by lions in a pit. For centuries, the image of Daniel in the lion's den has brought strength and hope and courage and determination to faithful people. 
And the question that kept rattling around for me this week is, do we really know the story of Daniel in the lion's den? Do we know all of it or maybe just the, the end <laughs> that he got out? Join me on this journey. Go back with me to the land of the Medes and the Persians. Daniel is an enslaved Jewish person serving in the court of King Darius. He is an exceptional human being, Daniel is. And King Darius was a good man enough, but he was a lazy man. Darius was in charge of this kingdom, but he did not want to do the work of the kingdom or pay attention to the kingdom. So, he assigned a lot of other people to do the work for him. King Darius was a kind enough person, but he was easily manipulated. King Darius had the besetting sin of so many people in power, he was subject to flattery. And so Daniel was this, uh, Darius was this kind of all-powerful person, but the truth is he was trapped. He was trapped by his own ignorance, by his refusal to do the work, by his laziness, by his, by his lack of attention. And ultimately, King Darius was trapped because he was afraid of looking small. Now, Daniel, Daniel was a wise person. It says there was an extraordinary spirit in Daniel. And so the king appointed 120 nobles to make decisions for the kingdom and three ministers, uh, uh, secretaries, who would make all of the decisions for them. Daniel was one of those secretaries. Daniel was, in fact, the best of them. And King Darius wanted to promote him to be in charge of everyone. Now, the other ministers and the satraps, the nobles, were jealous. How dare this upstart, upjump Daniel from way over in the middle of nowhere take control of our kingdom? And so they plotted to bring Daniel down a notch. They could find no flaws in his character. There was nothing in the opposition research that they could use against Daniel. But they thought he's so faithful to his religion, surely there's something in his faithfulness that we can turn against him. So, so they barged into the king. And remember, the king is a decent person, but subject to flattery and kind of lazy and not that sharp. They barged into the king and they said, Oh, king, live forever. You are so wise and you're looking well and you're, very, you're looking very strong and healthy today. We have this idea of how you can, um, uh, you know, help the kingdom. We think that you should create a decree that says that no one in the kingdom may petition anyone other than you, no, no prayers, no requests, or anything like that, for 30 days upon penalty of death. Because, oh, great one, you are so great, and this will help everyone else to know how great you are. Well, this was absurd on its face. I mean, how do you police something like this? But the king was really subject to flattery and afraid of looking weak. He didn't want to say no, so he said, well, golly, I think that's a good idea. And they said, yes, it is a good idea. In fact, we think it's such a good idea that you should write it down and sign it because you know a written decree from the law of the Medes and the Persians cannot be undone. And he said, well, well sure, sure, bring me the paper. I'll write it down. So they wrote it down for him, and he signed his name. And they had talked to everyone about it, except for Daniel. Daniel heard about this new decree, and he went to do as he always did, to pray in his house. Now, here's where the ancient sources of our story disagree. Some ancient sources said that Daniel did what he always did. He went to the upper room of his house where he had some open windows and lattice work and he could look out toward Jerusalem and he knelt and prayed like he always did. 
Some sources said that Daniel heard about this law and he said, huh, that doesn't sound right. I'm going to put it to the test. And he went to his upper room and he opened the windows so everyone would hear him. And he knelt down and he intentionally prayed so they could hear. Either way, this group of conspirators came barging in on Daniel and they said, we've got you. And then they ran back to the king. They barged in on the king, and they said, Oh, king, you're looking so well today. You're so wise. Thank you for all the good decisions you've made for us. Do you remember, I know you're busy, but do you remember that decree you signed? And he says, Yes, I remember. They say, Well, there's this person who's violated the decree, and don't you think that that means they should be thrown into the lion's pit? Isn't that what you said? He said, Yes, I, I remember that. That's what I said. And they said, well, Daniel has been praying to his God. And the king was trapped. You see, he was a man with immense power, but he wasn't that sharp. And they, they trapped him in this plot to get Daniel. And he actually liked Daniel. He wanted Daniel to live. So the king started to sweat bullets. He spent the whole day trying to figure out how to save Daniel. And later that night, the conspirators came once more, barged into the king's room and said, Oh, great one, king, live forever. It's time. Daniel needs to be thrown into the lion's pit. And so the king reluctantly agreed. Now the king wished Daniel well. He was predisposed to like Daniel and even maybe to believe in Daniel's God. So this pit of lions was kind of a thing you only get in a book, really. It, it was like a, a, an hourglass thing with a narrow top, I guess. And there were lions down there and they were hungry and they threw Daniel down into the pit and then they rolled a rock over top. And it says that the king hollered down the pit and he said, Daniel, may the king, that, may the God that you serve so well and faithfully save you, good luck. And then he took his signet ring and he sealed the wax around the stone. And then all of the nobles took their signet ring and sealed the wax around the stone so that the king would not conspire overnight to save Daniel and the nobles would not conspire overnight to kill Daniel. Daniel was well and truly stuck. And the king went to bed. He tried to sleep that night, but he couldn't get much sleep and nothing helped. They brought him food, he didn't want food. They brought him music, no music. They brought him friends, no friends. Nothing would help him. He tossed and turned all night long. And then in the morning, he ran out as soon as dawn broke and rolled the stone away. And really anxiously, he said, Daniel, did you make it? <laughs> Are you there? Daniel said, O king, live forever. My God sent an angel to shut the mouths of these lions and save me. Because my God knew that I had done you no harm and that I had done nothing wrong. And you see, Daniel knew what was going on. He knew that this law was not just about a power play. He knew this was about injustice. Daniel knew that he, the law preventing him from praying was deeply unjust, that his prayers harmed no one, did not harm the king, did not harm the nation. So he saw it through the right lens and said, King, I didn't hurt you and I didn't hurt God. God defended me not just because God likes me or because I worship God. God defended me because God is just. God is on the side of the innocent. The living God rescues those who are faithful and innocent. So, the king pulled Daniel out of the pit. And then the king went and got those other two uh, ministers, <laughs> the ones who had tricked him. 
And he got them, and he got their family. They're, they're, they, he threw them all down in the pit. And those lions had not eaten all night long. And it says they were devoured before they hit the ground. And then the king put out a decree that said, truly, the God of Daniel is the living God. That means the true God, the real God. Able to rescue, save, and deliver. Now, the truth of the story is that it's a fun story. It's meant to be a fun story. But you can see why down through the centuries it has brought faith and strength and hope to faithful people. You can see why Palestinians struggling to survive in the 6th century stood on the image of Daniel praying in the lion's den to join their struggle to survive with Daniel's story of rescue. You can see why early Christians who were grieving the death of their loved ones put the image of Daniel praying in the lion's pit over their graves because they said if God could res rescue Daniel and God could bring Jesus out of the tomb, then the resurrection hope is for us. You can see why those French Huguenot Christians who took so much courage and faith to worship in the face of violent repression said, we're following the example of Daniel, who was faithful and delivered. You can see why the enslaved African Americans caught this story of Daniel. You can see why Mahatma Gandhi said, Daniel is the one to follow. See, friends, in Jesus Christ, this deliverance that God offered to Daniel is available to all of us. In Jesus Christ, we have been delivered from death to life. So whatever we face, we face with faith and courage and hope in the God who delivers. Didn't my Lord deliver Daniel, deliver Daniel, deliver Daniel? Didn't my Lord deliver Daniel? Then why not everyone? In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.